MediStand Understanding Medicine I am Professor Azizur Rahman and I am also the founder of MediStand Understanding Medicine. We are in the series of discussions of various lectures on calcium metabolism and calcium related disorders. I have already covered a basic concept about calcium regulation and a lecture on hyperparathyroidism. And if you just landed here, I guess if you review those uh, slide, those uh, videos first, you will understand this one better. Because basic concepts have already been covered, so I will assume that you already know them. So I will be relatively brief in this presentation. Etiology of hypoparathyroidism. First of all, there is a condition called true hypoparathyroidism. Now, of course, when we say hypoparathyroidism, it has to be true hypoparathyroidism. But there is a reason we add the word true because there is something called pseudo hypoparathyroidism. In true hypoparathyroidism, as the name says, parathyroid gland is not functioning or is not there so there is actual deficiency of parathyroid hormone there could be congenital absence due to agenesis and the child is born without a parathyroid gland of course it will be a serious condition the child will not grow normally his skeleton will be abnormal and uh, this this child would probably not reach the adult life then there is autoimmune destruction. In adults, we see patients with hypoparathyroidism who have no history of surgery on the neck or who have never got, received any radiation. They just develop uh, hypoparathyroidism and this is believed to be due to autoimmune phenomenon. You know, uh, autoimmunity can be very selective due to some abnormality in the immune system in response to some antigen antibodies are formed against some other antigen but they cross react with parathyroid tissue and gradually destroy parathyroid glands so this will result in hypoparathyroidism this is also true hypoparathyroidism because parathyroid hormone is actually deficient then surgical removal uh, there are two possibilities. One is somebody underwent total or subtotal thyroidectomy. The thyroid was actually was to be removed, but parathyroid, since they are very small, they are very, very adherent to the, uh, the thyroid gland. So inadvertently, they got removed. And this should not happen in expert hands in modern days because we have very very sophisticated surgical techniques and very good tools to identify parathyroid but previously this used to happen after uh, thyroidectomy patient ended up with hypoparathyroidism A another possibility is that patient actually had parathyroid tumor or hyperparathyroidism and his parathyroids were intentionally removed uh, and they were removed completely. Normally, a small, a small portion of parathyroid gland is uh, preserved and left behind or is removed from its normal place and implanted somewhere else. But if that does not grow, that could also result in true hypoparathyroidism. A radioactive iodine ablation, I said in my lecture in uh, on hyperthyroidism that radioactive iodine has got very very uh, brief uh, penetration they do not go very deep so they are supposed to destroy thyroid gland only but occasionally it has been seen that the parathyroid glands have also been destroyed by the iodine which was given for radioactive iodine ablation as a treatment of hyperthyroidism so these are four conditions where there is actual deficiency of parathyroid hormone and that results in a true hypoparathyroidism now to differentiate it there's a condition called pseudo hypoparathyroidism it is hypoparathyroidism because clinical features are those of hypoparathyroidism 
and biochemical abnormalities are those of hypoparathyroidism but parathyroid hormone is there it is only that parathyroid hormone receptors are defective now parathyroid receptors are present on the bones they are present in the kidneys they are present on intestine and elsewhere so there could be actually selective uh, abnormality maybe parathyroid receptors are intact on bone and not on kidneys or maybe intact on kidneys and not on the bone so it would result in various combinations of disorders and collectively called pseudo hypoparathyroidism pseudo is something that is not real in other words parathormon is there actually in in these patient parathyroid uh, hormone is actually in excess but it is not working it is because of the tsh receptors that is why the word pseudo hypoparathyroidism now there is another funny condition called pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism this is pseudo of pseudo the pseudo is unreal and something which is not even unreal so what is it at these patients who have pseudo hypoparathyroidism they have some associated bony deformities and if you have those bony deformities but receptors are otherwise working patient does not have biochemical abnormality of hypoparathyroidism just the skeletal abnormalities it is called pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism also called albright disease now clinical features uh, if it develops in children suppose there is a genesis of uh, uh, parathyroid gland of course there will be stunted growth if it is hereditary and if it develops in adults then patient will be of normal height but there may be tetany what is tetany tetany is uh, a an abnormal movement uh, of the extremities and patient develops spasms because hypocalcemia stimulate muscular contraction so there may be involuntary contraction of uh, different muscles in the form of a, a kind of convulsions but the patient does not lose consciousness and corpopedial spasm is a specific abnormality patient's hand become like this there is a there is a contraction and the hands become like this and this is called corpopedial spasm and then we have other abnormalities patient may have hyperreflexia now you all remember hyperreflexia has many other causes uh, there could be upper motor neuron disease patient may have hyperthyroidism patient may be just nervous but in the proper context if patient has other features of hypocalcemia you would expect hyper reflexia in all deep tendon reflexes even jaw jerk will be brisk which is normally very difficult to elicit so hyper reflexia would represent hypocalcemic state if you have ruled out other causes of hyper reflexia then abdominal cramps uh, hypocalcemia also stimulate uh, in, intestinal movement so intestinal movement may be excessive and that might cause crampy abdomen now two important signs which are uh, known uh, uh, by the names who describe shostek sign and prozo sign the shostek sign means that if you tap gently and repeatedly on this part and this is where the facial nerve passes so if you tap repeatedly like this you tap it repeatedly but gently and the muscle this entire facial muscle will go into spasm and it will start contracting so there will be this will will show that nerves have become hyperactive and this is a positive sign indicating hypocalcemia the trouser sign means that if you apply cuff and inflate it above systolic blood pressure uh, just to make the arm ischemic uh, transiently and of course you have to watch very carefully you don't want to inflate for too long and for after a few seconds maybe a minute or so 
you will see that the patient's arm hand goes into corpopedial spasm. This is because hypocalcemic effect is further enhanced when there is uh, alkalosis uh, induced by this inflation. So these two signs are very characteristic of hypocalcemic state. Of course, these will be present in other conditions where there is hypocalcemia. But since in hypoparathyroidism, hypocalcemia is an important biochemical abnormality. So they will be present in hypoparathyroidism also. Laboratory abnormalities, of course, first we need to document that there is hypocalcemia. And I discussed in my last lecture that sometimes there is pseudo hypocalcemia. Now, if somebody has hypoalbuminemia, since calcium binds to albumin, 0.8 milligram of uh, calcium binds to 1 gram of uh, albumin. And if there is hypoalbuminemia, that will also manifest in the form of hypocalcemia because we measure total calcium. So we need to make correction if there is no reason to believe that this patient would have hypoalbuminemia, then you just believe in what you see in the report. But if there is any possibility of having hypoalbuminemia, for example, patient has nephrotic syndrome, patient has chronic liver disease, then you must measure the albumin make appropriate correction remembering that 0.8 milligram of calcium binds to one gram of albumin for example somebody's albumin is low by two gram 1.6 milligram calcium will also be low just because of hypoalbuminemia that would not matter because the albumin bound calcium is not important for nerve function so i hope i have made this point clear so once you are sure that there is uh, hypocalcemia that should be counted as one important biochemical abnormality of hypoparathyroidism there is hyperphosphatemia now this is very important because this actually differentiates hypoparathyroidism from vitamin d deficiency both cause hypocalcemia, both are relatively common condition, but in vitamin D deficiency, you have hypophosphatemia. I will discuss in another slide. In hypoparathyroidism, we have hyperphosphatemia because parathormone has opposite action on calcium and phosphate. Once there is not enough parathormone in the body, so there is nothing which will stop phosphate from coming back to the circulation so there will be hyperphosphatemia then there may be brain calcification uh, brain calcification can occur in both hypercalcemic state which is easy to understand but it actually occurs more commonly in hypocalcemic state now this may be difficult to understand but the explanation is it is not the absolute calcium level which uh, which causes this calcification it is the product of calcium and phosphate if that product is more than 30 that somehow promote tissue calcification especially the brain calcification now since in hypoparathyroidism there may be massive hyperphosphatemia despite low calcium this massive hyperphosphatemia will take this product above 30 and will promote calcification now, if there is a brain calcification, then you would expect some brain-related abnormality. Patient may have abnormal gait. Patient may have abnormality related to tone and speech and uh, other problems. PTH is low uh, because we are, we are uh, talking about true hypoparathyroidism. PTH will be low, but it will be high in pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. In pseudo hypoparathyroidism, the problem is not that there is not enough parathyroid hormone, but it is because the receptors are deficient. Parathyroid is there but not working. In fact, because of hypocalcemia, there will be uh, the parathyroid gland will be stimulated and actual amount of parathyroid in that blood will be high. So this is very interesting to know that in 
this is we are talking about hypoparathyroidism but actually PTH level is high. I will first discuss the differential diagnosis of hypocalcemia because that is often the starting point. Uh, there are three main causes uh, hypoparathyroidism, vitamin D deficiency and chronic renal failure. Now these are the tests based on calcium, phosphate and parathormone we can easily differ differentiate between these three conditions. Now first of all uh, hypoparathyroidism and we have discussed it in detail uh, parathormone will be low, calcium will be low and phosphate will be high and this point has been discussed in detail so I will not repeat it here. Whereas in vitamin D deficiency uh, the primary abnormality is reduced calcium, hypocalcemia and hypophosphatemia. Both are important. So hypocalcemia and hypophosphatemia both are important biochemical abnormalities in vitamin D deficiency. But out of these two, hypophosphatemia is more important. Why more important? Because number one, it is an early sign. It is possible that you might have a case where phosphate is low whereas calcium may still be normal or lower normal range. Because you know hypocalcemia will stimulate our parathyroid gland and parathyroid gland will produce more PTH is, uh, as an attempt to correct hypocalcemia. It will actually correct hypocalcemia to some extent but it will further aggravate hypophosphatemia. So hypophosphatemia will be an early abnormality in vitamin D deficiency and will be seen more regularly and more consistently. So that is why hypophosphatemia is particularly important. Now it is also important because hypophosphatemia will differentiate vitamin D deficiency associated hypocalcemia from hypoparathyroidism associated hypocalcemia because there hypocalcemia because there you have high phosphate level. The third possibility is chronic renal failure. In chronic renal failure, we have problem with the reabsorption of calcium from the renal tubules. So that will result in hypocalcemia. This hypocalcemia will stimulate parathyroid gland and parathormone will be released in large quantities uh, as a compensatory mechanism. And this is important and phosphate is particularly high. This is very important abnormality because hyperphosphatemia is actual stimulus for hyperparathyroidism. Now, although this may be uh, hyperparathyroidism may be corrective, uh, may correct calcium to a certain extent, but it also promotes bone loss and it increases the chances of CKD related bone disease. So we take hyperphosphatemia as a pathological state and when we treat chronic renal failure we address hyperphosphatemia and in one of the subsequent slides I will show you how we correct hyperphosphatemia. Now the differential diagnosis of various types of hypoparathyroidism we have true hypoparathyroidism due to whatever reason I discussed various causes and the parathyroid hormone is actually deficient then pseudo hypoparathyroidism where parathyroid hormone is not only present but it is present in excess but the, the parathyroid receptors are deficient so parathyroid hormone is not working then pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism which is just a skeletal abnormality so when we uh, discuss when we study their chemistry in true hypoparathyroidism parathormone is low and calcium is low and phosphate is high we have already discussed and in this condition there are no associated skeletal abnormality known as albright osteodystrophy in pseudo hypoparathyroidism parathyroid is there in fact in excessive quantity but it is uh, it is not functioning since it is not functioning as far as calcium is concerned there is no parathyroid so calcium will be low and phosphate will be high so as far as calcium and phosphate are concerned in true hypoparathyroidism and pseudo hypoparathyroidism 
the abnormality is the same but it is a pth level which differentiates if pth level is high despite chemistry of hypoparathyroidism that will suggest pseudo hypoparathyroidism and in these patient some of them they have these abnormalities related to the knuckles and other thing and this is called albright dystrophy so presence of these skeletal abnormality should uh, suggest to you that this patient may have pseudo hypoparathyroidism pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism is just a normal person as far as calcium phosphate alkaline phosphatase and pth is concerned they have normal chemistry only they have these abnormalities which are normally associated with pseudo 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 hypoparathyroidism they are there but pth receptors are otherwise working and there is no calcium abnormality uh, treatment of hypoparathyroidism now ideally i would i think naturally one would think that if parathyroid hormone is absent we need to replace parathyroid hormone uh, that is possible and only recently it became available but it is very very expensive i think our population our people cannot afford this uh, recombinant parathormone so what we do is we actually create a state of hypervitaminosis d please try to understand vitamin d is not deficient in these patient patient has actually deficiency of parathyroid hormone but since vitamin d raises serum calcium now if we create a state of vitamin d, vitamin d toxicosis that means we raise the vitamin d level to a very high level that will cause hypercalcemia and will actually correct hypocalcemia typical dose is vitamin d act, uh, the the usual form 50000 international uh, international units 50000 international units orally daily so for a normal person this would be considered a massive dose but in these patients since we want to create hypervitaminosis d state so that is the dose which we use it has to be given in this large dose daily the other uh, possibility is that we have active form of vitamin Uh, D calcitriol 125 dihydroxypolycalcifluor or semi-active uh, alpha calcidol. Now they may be used because they are more potent than uh, the natural vitamin D. You know, natural vitamin D needs to be activated in the presence of parathormone. So it is possible that we give large doses of vitamin D. and still it is not working because we don't have parathormone here so the solution is that we give active form of vitamin d which is calcitriol which is the final active hormone this is available in the form of tablets so this can be given in place of uh, natural vitamin d so this will actually reduce pill burden because patient would need much smaller dose as compared to natural vitamin d and this is preferable then we have to give them calcium because they are hypocalcemic no any type of calcium is not okay it has to be calcium carbonate now what is so special about calcium carbonate because it serves two purposes number one it will replace calcium which is so much needed but the other purpose is this carbonate part carbon the once we ingest calcium carbonate and Uh, uh this calcium carbonate should be taken with meal now patient with hypoparathyroidism are instructed not to take phosphate phosphate rich diet but some phosphate is always present in our diet so if patient takes calcium carbonate tablets two or three tablets with every meal so what how will this work this in the in the stomach calcium and carbonate will dissociate and then since phosphate has greater affinity for calcium so phosphate will bind with calcium so the phosphate which was present in the stomach and in the, in, in the intestine which was to be absorbed otherwise that will be bound with calcium and this will make an insoluble salt calcium phosphate and that will be excreted with stool 
So in fact, main reason of giving calcium carbonate is not calcium replacement because any calcium could do that job, but calcium carbonate is used as a phosphate binder. Why do we need to bind phosphate? Because these patients have hyperphosphatemia and hyperphosphatemia is a stimulus for hyperparathyroidism and that is responsible for bone uh, disease. So that is very interesting mechanism of action, calcium carbonate with meat. PTH therapy is available, uh, not in our country. It is, and it is not that PTH which we use for the prevention of fracture in osteoporosis. This is a new PTH and which is used for uh, hypoparathyroidism, but I, I believe we do not have it in our country. We still treat patients with high, this vitamin D. And I think in my experience, most of the patients I have seen are either congenital absent or those patients where parathyroid was inadvertently removed as a complication of thyroidectomy. That concludes my lecture on hypoparathyroidism and I really look forward to see you in the last lecture of, of this series uh, on calcium related disorders and that will be on vitamin D deficiency. Till that time, thank you very much and goodbye.